So, uh, as the uh, worship leader this morning, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, he is me. Yay. 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 How's the sound? How's the sound in the balcony? We sound good? We good? Awesome. I just want to say thank you, first of all, to the, to the mission uh, for having me here. It's a great honor. I am uh, the worship elder at Emmanuel Lutheran Church here, right here in Schenectady. Uh, I teach in Schenectady. I prayed the Lord would give me ministry in Schenectady. At the time, I really didn't have a home church. And God led me to Emmanuel, and God led me here to the mission. I dropped a card off one day at back to school night. Because they really didn't have anything to do. I was like, yeah, I'm going to grab a cup of tea, and maybe I'll, you know. And I'm like, hey, you know what? Maybe I'll stop the mission. It's on the way. Talk to some guys. If you ever need anybody, I play guitar. I do some stuff. Eric got a hold of me. And the rest is history. <laughs> so today I want to talk about love, okay? You might be familiar with the love chapter in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. Paul writes a great chapter. My wife and I, when we got remarried... That's my wife over there. Her name is Tracy. Everybody say hi, Tracy. She likes it when you give her attention like that. When we got remarried on our 15th wedding anniversary, which is a testimony in itself, uh, my daughter Max read that chapter. It's a great chapter. Paul uses the word for love, agape, eight times in that chapter. Do you know that? But John... John uses the word 27 times in the verses that I'm going to unpack today. Agape love is unconditional, universal, empathetic love. Love for others. It's not eros. It's not romantic love. It's not philia or brotherly love. That's where we get Philadelphia from, right? You didn't know you were going to get a Greek lesson, right? That's all I know. That's it. I, I like that much Greek, like kindergarten Greek. But it's agape love. I think if John uses the word 27 times in 14 verses, he's trying to teach us something. So I want to unpack these today. And I think he's emphasizing love to his readers because back then, first century Christianity, today... There's an awful lot of angry Christians out there. I don't, there's a lot of hate. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of disgust. There's a lot of animosity. Just keep looking ahead. Don't look around. Not you guys. I'm just saying out there. It continues today. So I feel with uh, the coronavirus and everything that's happened that uh, it's getting worse. It feels like it's getting worse. So we need love more than ever. So John wrote this letter to encourage us and teach us about love. The first thing John's trying to teach us is that this love is not a what. This love is a who. 1 John 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He. He. Verse 8. He who does not love God does not know God. For God is love. So who is love? God. God is love. Hang on just a second. We're having some technical difficulties. Fortunately, I have a plan B. It's all good. I got a big mouth. What am I kidding? I can talk to 25 kindergartners and they can all do the same thing at the same time. I got to have a pretty big mouth. So, first things, God is love. We have to acknowledge that there is a God and he created this universe. He created us. He's kind of a big deal, okay? In fact, God is perfect. If he was imperfect, 
He wouldn't be God. Amen? So therefore, God's love is a perfect kind of love. This love, in fact, is part of God's very nature. It's in his essence. It permeates his character and his other attributes. And when he created us, he created us with certain needs. We have a need to be accepted. We have a need for safety, security. We have the need to have a purpose. And we have the need for love. God created us to need love, but we look for that love in this world. And it doesn't fill the need. The world gives us lust, idolatry, addiction. The only way we can truly meet our need for love is through God. His perfect love perfectly meets our needs. Amen? And we know this perfect love of God if we are born of God and if we know God. Now that word know is important. Again, a little bit of a Greek lesson. That's okay. I won't be too long with it. The Greek word is gnosko. It means I'm taking in knowledge by personal experience. It requires an active relationship between the one who knows and the person who's known. Jesus, Jesus uses this word in John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, understand this. Jesus wasn't selling fire insurance. You hear me? He wasn't selling fire insurance. Salvation, eternal life, begins the moment you put your trust and faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's when your eternal life starts. That relationship starts immediately. And it's active. Jesus wants it to be active. He wants to participate in your life. And he wants you to participate with him. It continues throughout your life. Philippians 1.6 Oh, Jesus who began a good work in you We'll finish it, we'll complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, right? God who starts that work will finish his work. Next, John shows us how we're even able to know this love. Verse 9 says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world. That we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That perfect agape love, it was manifested towards us. It was shown to us. Through the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. I have not seen God. In fact, in verse 12, John says nobody's seen God. Nobody. But we have seen God through the ministry of Jesus Christ. We have seen that love shown to us. And propitiation, that's just a $5 word that means it's like an accounting term. The books have been wiped clean. Your sins have been forgiven. And I love how Apostle John, he breaks this down a little further in Romans 5, verses 8 through 11. I love this stuff. I love this stuff. Because we don't want to talk. You want to talk about honey in the rock? <laughs> this is some sweet stuff here. This is for you. It says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you. I was waiting for that. I needed something. Give me a little something. So that's sweet, man. That's like ice cream, right? That's good stuff. But wait a minute. He goes on to say, much more than. Whoa, wait a minute. Now it's not just ice cream. 
Now it's one of those all, you know, all you can eat Sunday bars. Now, I, now you look at me, you know I eat. I can eat. So he says much more than I'm like, yeah, come on now. Hot fudge, caramel, here we go. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So God's no longer angry at us. Our sins are forgiven. We are declared righteous through the work of Jesus Christ. And we aren't made righteous. Because you know you, I know me. And I know sometimes I'd be driving or something, and if you want to know me, you can go talk to Tracy. She'll tell you a little bit. I'm not righteous, but I've been declared righteous through the work of Jesus Christ so that God no longer holds my sins against me, and I can approach a holy God. Not only that, oh, come on. Not only that, for if we were enemies, we were reconciled through him, through God, through the death of his son. Here comes. Here's the sprinkles. Much more than having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So your sins are now, are now forgiven. You have been reconciled to God. So therefore, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of truth can enter into you. Because God no longer holds your sins against you. Amen? And not only that. Here's the cherry on top of the Sunday. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So now, when we live through him, like John says, we live through him, Jesus Christ. We now get joy. We rejoice. We have joy. We have love. We have peace. Because we begin to understand who God is. And we understand his love that he has shown for us. And what he has done for us. Amen? That is so important. Because then, if you know God and you understand what he did for you. Then John takes it. He steps it up a notch. Verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. Because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God... God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. He says it again. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Whew, that's a mouthful. We receive this love of God. Upon our salvation via the Holy Spirit. Amen. God abides in us and we abide in God. That word abide, it is a constant presence. It is continually operative. It don't go away. Once you get the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is there to stay. You may wander. Again, look straight ahead. Don't look to your left or the right. You may wander, but God does not wander. He is not a man that he should lie. When he, sends, he send, when he says he'll send the Spirit and that the love of God will never se be separated from us, nothing can separate us from the love of God. I'll get my words right. Don't you worry. Nothing can separate us. Nothing. God's Spirit, my wife will appreciate this, is crocheted to my spirit. I was going to say knit, but you know what? I know you don't knit, honey. I know you crochet. It's like our spirits are together now. And we're like one. It's not just Scott. Because Scott's kind of raggedy. It's Scott plus Jesus. And Scott plus Jesus can do all things. <laughs> if we abide in God, 
the love becomes perfected in us. It, that word perfected means complete, becomes accomplished, it becomes finished. How? John says, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. If we love one another. You got to remember that this is a process because it's hard for me to love the guy that cuts me off on the road or the one who like jumps in line at the Walmart, right? It's hard for me to love people like that. Heck, it's hard for me to love some of my family members. And, you know, I'll let it that out later. But this is a process. Remember that. It's a, an active relationship. What I want you to understand, folks, there's a lot of people that pray a prayer and keep right on going. Like it's the express line. I'm out. You can't just pray a prayer and not get to know God. Jesus said to, to, to know God and Jesus, that's eternal life. That's what Paul said was the greatest thing, the one thing above all things, was to know Jesus. If you don't develop that relationship, you have a shallow immature relationship of God. And it, and it shows. It shows with the lack of love. You can see it in the world. My love, my love is selfish. My love is fickle. My love is lacking. I keep records of wrong. I hold grudges. I get angry. So I can't love Dan with my love. Because I know it's going to fail. I have to love with the love that's been given to me. Did y'all hear that in the back? Yes, sir. You have to love with the love that's been given to you by the Holy Spirit. That is a perfect love. And if I love with that, I can show that perfect love to somebody else. Uh, strangers, total strangers. I can love on them. Family members that I know, eh, they've done some stuff. People that I know, look, yeah, they've done some stuff. That worker who does, you know, people you work with, your next door neighbor who borrowed your chainsaw and never returned it. I mean, the list goes on and on, right? Isn't this a beautiful day? Yep. I just got to take a moment, right? It's beautiful out there. Sun's shining. Trees are blooming. Birds are singing. It's easy. I can walk through. I can go for a walk. And I can just look up in the sky. And I can look at the trees. I've been going camping a lot. <coughs> My son picked on me. He said I like Snow White. So I'd be sitting outside the trailer and talking to the birds and stuff as they come around. You know, God reveals himself through, his, through nature. You can see it. But I, I, I'm telling you, John, and John is saying that the main way that God reveals himself to the world, because nobody's seen God. There's, there's Christ, number one. And John said in the beginning of his letter, he walked with Christ. He talked with Christ. He sat down with Christ. He knew him, and he's talking about it. The other way is when Christians love others. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's Colossians 1.27. It's the hope of glory toward God. That we would love one another. Amen? How are we doing? I have no idea how I'm doing for time. How long we got? A couple hours? Five minutes. All right, good. I only got two pages left. I'll talk fast, but you got to listen hard. Here we go. Verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. 
but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. In case you were wondering, that's a little reminder, this isn't heaven. This is not heaven. We live in a morally broken pain machine called earth. The world. There are problems. There's nasty people. There's debts that I got to pay. There's guilt. There's shame. There's anger. There's more nasty people. There's judgment. There's unforgiveness. There is fear in this world and fear in our hearts. And God's perfect love casts out that fear. Why? Because fear involves torment. God said you should love your neighbor as yourself. Well, how about this? What if you don't love yourself very much? You can't love anybody else. You, yeah, preach. What if you don't love yourself very much? What if you harbor resentment? What if you harbor unforgiveness? What if you harbor guilt or shame? That is torment. For the believer, God's perfect love works to cast that stuff out. Now, I've been saved about 15 years. There are some things that I willingly have forgotten. <laughs> like what I ate for dinner last night. But, you know, my mind sometimes... I have a hard time remembering things. But I remember Scott from 15 years ago. And I don't want to forget it. Because that is a testimony. You want a miracle? How about my salvation? How about that God took me... Low, good, dirty, rotten, funky rascal. And he saved me. Got kicked out of the house two weeks later. But, you know, God didn't say it was going to be all rainbows. <laughs> I got to keep going. I'll do my testimony some other time. So what do we do with this love? John says... Verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he makes it plain. He says he is a liar. For who does not love his brother whom he has seen? How can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. I want to close by going to Matthew chapter 5 real quick. Verses 13 to 16. God, Jesus was saying that we are salt and we are light. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's good for nothing. It would be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. We are the salt of the earth, but that flavor is the Holy Spirit. You don't have that, you're going to be trampled. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under the basket. But on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify your Father in heaven. We are the light of the world. Our light comes via the love of God that has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen? If you want to know this perfect love, I don't assume anything. If you don't know God's perfect love, what you have to do is you have to believe in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I, I used to teach kindergarten. Salvation is as easy as A, B, C. A, admit that you are a sinner in need of God. B, believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again for your sins. And C, choose that Jesus Christ be the Lord and Savior of your life. And it's just a simple prayer that you can pray. Dear God, I admit I'm a sinner, and I put my trust in you. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose again so that I can receive your Holy Spirit. I choose Jesus Christ to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and giving me everlasting life here on earth and with you in heaven. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. And for the believers in the house, my benedictions borrowed from my former pastor, okay? And now, may the love of God your Father go above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, before you to guide you, behind you to encourage you, beneath you to make your footsteps firm, and within you to give you his eternal peace. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Appreciate you. Appreciate your ministry here to us. Thank you, guys. Us.